Hello, good evening, sir. Uh, Dr. Davi, so please unmute yourself. Yes, yes. Good evening. Uh, good evening. Uh, Upendra, sir, good evening. So please unmute, unmute yourself. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Hello, good evening. Good Hello, evening, good everyone. Evening, sir. Good evening, good evening. Uh, uh, Vipin, sir, uh, Hitesh, sir, good evening. Please unmute yourself and switch on the video. Hello, Hitesh, sir. Hello. Hello, good evening, Hello. sir. Good evening, good evening. Sir, welcome, sir. Uh, Hitesh, sir. Namaskar, Dr. Pender, sir. Namaskar. Namaskar, sir. Kaise hai, sir? Ravi, Ravi ji, kya hal hai? Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening. Andy. Hello, Hitesh, sir. Are you there? There is some connection problem. Uh, yes, so we'll again rejoin. So uh, I think, sir, our participants will keep on joining. Uh, we should not waste time and we should start the session. So, good evening, uh, everyone. So uh, I'm Dr. Raman Sharma. I'm assistant professor at Malana Zad Medical College. And uh, uh, I welcome you all on behalf of Haryana AOI in these academic lecture series, which are... Uh, uh, according to the PG uh, uh, MS or DNB uh, curriculum. So, uh, as we all know, biology is a very important part of uh, the ENT as far as the DNB and MS exams are concerned. So, in these academic lecture series, we have divided the audiology part session into two. So, in the previous session, uh, we have covered Puritan audiometry and impedance audiometry. And the lecture was delivered by a, a very uh, experienced and uh, eminent faculty from GMC Chandigarh, Dr. Uh, Ravi Kapoor. And uh, uh, today also in the second part, uh, yes, left over uh, sir is going to uh, cover the remaining part of the audiology. He'll be including uh, Bera and uh, speech audiometry and some special test of hearing. Right, sir? So uh, today we have uh, our uh, moderators. I would like to introduce our moderate for to, uh, moderators for today's session. We have Dr. Vipin Aroda, sir. Welcome, sir. Sir is a uh, uh, director professor at University College of Medical Sciences. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir, for and uh, thank you for uh, sparing your time and uh, uh, for at such a short notice. So thank you very much, sir. And uh, second, we have uh, Dr. Hitesh Verma, sir is additional professor at uh, All India Institute of Medical Science, Delhi. Uh, I welcome you, sir, and uh, thank you for, uh, for be, uh, being a part of uh, today's session. Uh, Hitesh, sir, please unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, sir. Thank um, you for inviting me. Okay. Good everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Sir, we can uh, start uh, the session. Uh, Ravi, sir, you can please start sharing your screen and then we can start the session. So uh, before uh, we start, so I request everyone to please uh, post their comments or any queries in the chat box. So our moderators will uh, take up those queries and uh, uh, they will be... Uh, uh, taken uh, by them and uh, it will be told to our uh, speaker for today's session and Dr. Davi Kapoor will answer all the queries. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Davi Kapoor, over to you, sir. You can start now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ravan. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share information uh, with the all my heartfelt regards to all my seniors and uh, is my screen visible please it is visible you can go to the uh, slideshow yeah 
Yeah, that's right. So thanks once again for inviting me for the presentation. I'm grateful to the organizers. Uh, the topic of our today's discussion will be uh, under the audiometry heading. We will be covering the speech audiometry, special uh, audiological tests, and uh, the auditory brainstem response audiometry. So starting with the speech audiometry, we'll be covering in, uh, this uh, topic under the headings of uh, overview indications, contraindications, equipment, technique, samples, and references. Uh, speech audiometry has, we all know, has become a fundamental tool in the assessment of hearing. And along with the pure tone audiometry, it is uh, used to determine the degree and type of uh, hearing loss. The information which it provides include the discomfort or tolerance to the speech stimuli and the information on the uh, word recognition abilities. It also helps to determine the gain and the maximum power output whenever hearing aid fitting has to be done. Also, it can be used to assess how well a person is able to hear speech whenever there is noise around. So therefore, it also uh, guides and leads us to through the audiological rehabilitation management process. So it can be used to assess the degree and type of hearing loss, word recognition ability examination, examination of discomfort or tolerance to speech stimuli, determination of proper gain maximum power output for the amplifying devices, and to assess the uh, process of audiological rehabilitation before, during, and after the management. Uh, it should not be done if the patient is not cooperative. No anesthesia is as such required for speech audiometry. The setup in which we perform a speech audiometry procedure is typically a two-room setup. The first room is the control room wherein the equipment of uh, such as the speech audiometer is placed. And the other room in which the patient is placed is known as the test room. Uh, we can see a typical speech audiometer being placed in the control room. It's having a microphone with it and some other inputs, input devices such as the CD player or the tape recorders through which the speech stimuli can be presented and uh, these are delivered through the output devices to the in which are placed inside the test room these devices would be the earphones placed on the ears or the insert earphones which are inserted into the ear canal the bone vibrators or the loudspeakers and uh, uh, the the stimulus the, the speech stimuli are are presented through these uh, uh, output devices or transducers to the person who is being tested. So the first technique which is used is termed as speech awareness threshold. It is also called speech detection threshold. And uh, it helps in uh, the measurement of uh, the, 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 the speech. Uh, the presence of speech is actually desired to be uh, checked. So only if it is present, the speech is present or not, this is what a person has to determine and give his or her response. The stimuli which are used, the materials which are used for assessing the speech awareness threshold are the spondy words, which are basically bisyllabic words and various types of uh, uh, speech word lists are available in various uh, languages which are comfortable for uh, the person. In English, for example, pancake, hardware, playground, etc. In Hindi, we can say ghar bar, aaj kal, maa baap, something of that sort. Equal stress on both 
syllables is placed so uh, the the information which, uh, which this stimulus uh, carries is easily and uh, easy and sufficient to to get elicit the the response uh, it can be used for uh, young children also and uh, they may repeat the words or they may just report the uh, presence of uh, the speech stimuli usually the level at which the speech awareness threshold is uh, achieved in a person corroborates in a person who has got a normal hearing by 10 to 15 decibels plus or minus so uh, in cases where the loss is sharply sloping for example at high frequencies this hearing loss slopes sharply then the speech awareness threshold it corroborates more towards those frequencies which are better so it usually uh, becomes a bit uh, less uh, correlating with, with each other and sometimes it, it may be misleading the second technique is speech recognition threshold which is also termed as speech reception threshold and in this the person uh, is uh, uh, the, the stimulus which a person is being presented with is again the spondy words, the bisyllabic words. And the task is to repeat the words and uh, continuously reducing the intensity at which these words are presented. And the level at which at least 50% of the times these words are repeated correctly is termed as the speech reception threshold or speech recognition threshold. Various uh, word lists, as I shared, are available in various different languages. And uh, almost all, all Indian languages, uh, these uh, word lists are available and have been published. <clears throat> if we see the pure tone thresholds at 500, 1000, and 2000 hertz, the speech reception threshold correlates around at around 5 to 12 decibels of the pure tone average of three frequencies. So like uh, in this table, as I have depicted that uh, at three frequencies, uh, 45, 50 and uh, 55 dB. So it is say for example, 10 to 12 decibels plus or minus. Uh, at this level of average 50 dB of pure tone average. The confusion is created whenever there is a uh, high frequency increase or slope. So for example, at 545 dB, 1000 Hertz, 55 dB, 2000 Hertz, if it is 80 decibels, then uh, the, the high frequency average, which if we see the uh, three frequency average, if we take, it is 60 decibels. If we take uh, uh, 500, uh, sorry, two frequency average, then it is somewhat, uh, it is, it comes to be 50 decibels. So um, if it is a three frequency average, then again, it is uh, 10 to 12 decibels. And uh, if it is a, uh, two frequency uh, average then it is uh, around six plus minus 60 to 40 decibels so this is how we can uh, calculate and estimate the correlation between a pure tone average and a speech reception threshold to corroborate whether the results are uh, matching with each other then another technique which uh, we utilize is very important again the speech discrimination score, abbreviated as SDS. It is a supra threshold uh, measure. And uh, the person is uh, required to, the person is required to repeat again the words and the st uh, speech stimuli which is used is a uh, PB word list, which is a basically a monosyllable syllabic word list and uh, it is also phonetically balanced 
and uh, these are these lists word lists are available in in various languages including the indian all the indian languages then the number of words in the word list say for example if 50 words are presented the person is required to repeat each and every word and if it is correct a 2% score to one uh, correct response is given the maximum score being 100% so uh, that is how it is calculated and uh, reported it be printed in voice through microphone by the person who is uh, actually uh, taking the procedure or it can also be alternatively presented through the cd versions of various uh, word lists so these are available commercially and uh, the presentation level which at which the uh, in, the intensity of the presentation level is usually 25 to 40 decibels above the speech reception thresholds so a range is provided but usually in our setup we follow a 40 db uh, whenever the threshold speech reception threshold say for example if it is uh, uh, 55 decibels then the presentation level for speech discrimination score is 55 plus 40 that means 95 decibels it is not varied and it is kept uh, static and then the person has to repeat so and uh, if we lower the intensity level lower scores can be observed then another variation of uh, this uh, uh, speech discrimination score which is observed uh, usually it is observed that uh, in cases of uh, uh, cochlear pathology the discrimination score is relatively higher as compared to the retrocochlear pathology where the discrimination score is observed to be lower so if we plot uh, uh, performance and intensity uh, graph like as shown in this particular figure uh, on the x axis the intensity level is increased and on the y axis the performance is observed for normals it increases and uh, reaches uh, uh, almost uh, 100% and then it keeps on at that level it does not vary with increase in further increase, increase in the intensity level. Similarly for conductive hearing loss and uh, sensory neural hearing loss. But for neural hearing loss or the retrocochlear pathology, we observe there is with a further increase in the intensity, there is a, a decrease in the percentage score. So here it is termed as the rollover effect has taken place or the rollover phenomenon has taken place. So this is typical of uh, retrocochlear pathology. Then this uh, speech dis discrimination score is again useful for uh, the candidates uh, assessment for hearing aids. And uh, at conversational levels, if we observe the discrimination score, we can predict the candidacy of a hearing aid recipient. Further techniques which we commonly use include the most comfortable level and the uncomfortable level, the MCL or the UCL. So the MCL is basically, um, again, the speech stimulus is the spondy words or a running speech. And uh, at a supra threshold level, slightly above the speech reception threshold, usually at 40 to 50 decibels above the speech reception threshold, uh, the comfortable levels of loudness are observed. And uh, those having sensory neural hearing losses, it may be reduced due to the phenomenon of recruitment, which we will be discussing in, in, in our further slides. And uh, secondly, at further supra threshold levels, the maximum level at which the word discrimination score uh, is, is administered and 
beyond that the person feels that it is uncomfortable to hear to that particular speech stimulus so this also helps us in uh, calculating the uh, dynamic range the speech reception threshold and the uncomfortable levels so if we subtract the ucl from srt we get a, a dynamic range of that particular person so normally the ucl and uh, <coughs> srt for a, a normal hearing person say for example uh, uh, 90 to 100 decibels and uh, if uh, the the speech reception threshold is somewhere at uh, 20 decibels so if we subtract it comes out to be say around more than 80 decibels so the the uh, some some uh, pearls of or trip, tips and tricks which we can share from the literature are mainly focused on uh, the hearing aid uh, satisfaction so they uh, have observed that uh, while the using the speech testing in general it has not necessarily been shown to predict hearing aid sat satisfaction the use of loudness discomfort levels that is the ucl has been shown to be useful in successful hearing aid outcomes the acceptable noise levels uh, which we measure uh, which are the measure of amount of background noise that a person can tolerate is helpful and uh, in recent years it has gained interest among the researchers and hearing care professionals because of its ability to predict with 85% accuracy who will be successful candidate for hearing aids these were the references uh so moving further with the the second uh, uh, heading the special audiological procedures we apply these procedures to differentiate between cochlear pathology and retrocochlear pathology so the abnormal rapid or steep growth of loudness with increasing intensity is the characteristic of the phenomenon in observed in cochlear pathology termed as recruitment it is associated with the sensory neural deafness the exact cause may not be understood but uh, it is uh, pathognomic to the its absence is pathognomic to the retrocochlear lesion but uh, the absence of recruitment does not rule out cochlear pathology to observe or quantify or measure recruitment the various procedures which are used include alternate binaural loudness balance test the ablb it is the direct test of recruitment uh, the other one is the short in increment sensitivity index sisi which is an indirect measure for ablb the step 1 is that the hearing threshold through air conduction mode should be observed at the various frequencies the attenuator dial for the worse ear uh, now it is usually applied to a unilateral type of hearing loss where one ear is having normal hearing the other ear is having hearing loss say for example 40 decibels so the attenuator dial for the worse ear will be set to 20 decibels above that threshold so 40 db if, say for example 40 db is the uh, hearing loss plus 20 db at 60 decibels the uh, the attenuator dial will be set in the worse ear and it will be 0 decibels in the uh, 0 db sl that means if it is 20 decibels say for example in the normal ear then it will be 20 decibels only so then in the third step the tones will alternate between the two ears the tone will be automatically through the the audiometer we don't have to do anything we just have to uh, press start and it alternates between the two ears the person has to indicate if 
which one which uh, ear the sound is perceived louder so if it is louder in the worse ear <clears throat> then uh, it, it is raised by 5 decibels in the better ear and if it is louder in the normal ear then it is raised or or decreased rather decreased by 5 decibels in the better ear so by uh, performing this uh, procedure we are able to plot the results on either a ladder gram which is uh, depicted in the lower uh, uh, picture and or the uh, steinberg gardner plot in the above uh, graph so the first the a uh, ladder gram is a normal hearing the the ladder is complete symmetrical the b uh, ladder gram shows no recruitment the all the lines are parallel we can see there is a loss in one ear the other ear is normal the right ear has got loss of uh, 40 decibels and the left ear is normal and the lines are running parallel to each other this indicates no recruitment is there then the c is with recruitment we can see there is a diverging uh, configuration so this is a, a recruitment this this ladder gram is showing recruitment in the d1 again the divergence is there but it is not as marked as the c ladder gram so this is partial recruitment then in the e ladder gram we can see it is diverging very uh, significantly. So this is uh, uh, observed in the hyper recruitment cases. And in the F ladder gram, we can see it is converging. So this is the condition uh, where the decruitment is labeled. So this is the, these are the patterns which we observe from the ABLP and uh, these are further interpreted. And in case of uh, uh, bilateral hearing loss, we use monaural loudness balance where uh, the two frequencies are used. One is uh, termed as, uh, is taken as the reference. The other one is the test frequency. And then similarly, the ladder grams are plotted. Usually they had uh, discovered this observation and this procedure and interpretations for unilateral type of hearing losses. The other uh, procedure, the short increment sensitivity index, SISI, uh, it uh, measures the ability of a person to detect change of one decibels intensity to a steady tone of 20 decibels above the threshold. If the threshold is 40 decibels, it is presented at uh, 60 decibels and uh, initially to a steady tone uh, and an increase in the intensity of 5 decibels is introduced as a practice and then 5 to 3 decibels it is reduced then that increment uh, intensity is reduced to 2 decibels and when it is reduced to 1 decibel the test actually starts. A positive score of 60% uh, of above is indicative of uh, cochlear pathology. The person is given instructions to keep the hand raised till the time the tone is audible. Whenever it increases in intensity, the person closes the hand and again raises it. So the number of times that increase is presented and the hand is again closed and raised are calculated. The number of times the presentations are given and the number of times the correct um, score is observed response is correct response is observed the score is calculated accordingly so if it is more than 60 percent it indicates cochlear pathology and uh, so so this was about the cochlear pathology the, the tests for cochlear pathology moving ahead to uh, the retrocochlear pathology the phenomenon of decay 
uh, in cases of uh, retrococcular pathologies, the phenomenon of decay in a steady state tone uh, with time is observed. It is usually uh, presented that a pure tone is presented at a supra threshold level, either threshold or supra threshold. But usually uh, we start from threshold level and go till supra threshold level. And the person is asked to keep the hand raised till the time the tone is audible. And uh, if it, it, it reduces, even if it reduces in intensity, the hand has to be ra kept raised. And if it dies off, decays off completely, then the person lowers the hand down. Again, then we increase the uh, intensity. So the frequencies tested include 500, 1000, 2000 and 4000 Hertz. And uh, it is defined as the reduction in the ability to hear a sustained tone. The difference between the threshold and the level at which the uh, test is terminated is numerically calculated and given as the result. So for example, if the person is having a 40 decibels of uh, hearing loss at 1000 Hertz, the tone decay test starts at 40 decibels and the intensity is increased in 5 dB steps. Each time the person loses the perception of tone, it is uh, increased in 5 dB steps. So say, for example, after one minute, it is, it is run, the, the test tone is run for one minute, one minute. After one minute, if it, the dial reading was 70 decibels, so threshold was 40 decibels, it was started at 40 decibels, 70 minus 40 is equal to 30 dB of tone decay in that particular ear at that particular frequency. So there are two important uh, significance. Uh, clinical significance. First is the amount of decay which is observed. Second is the rate of decay. So looking at the first one, the amount of decay for normal hear, hearing persons, usually 10, 0 to 10 decibels across all frequencies is considered to be in the within the normal range. <clears throat> For cochlear losses, it is 0 to 15 decibels, but might at uh, high frequencies go as high as 25 decibels, but rarely reaches 30 decibels. <clears throat> the maximum decay in retrocochlear losses is observed uh, till 30 to 35 decibels. So 500 and 2000 hertz should definitely be checked to differentiate between cochlear or retrocochlear pathology. As depicted in this uh, table, normal 0 to 10 decibels of tone decay may be considered as normal. Uh, cochlear losses 0 to 15 decibels, rarely 25 at high frequency. Retrocochlear 30 to 35 decibels. The second significance of rate of decay is the rate of decay differs in cochlear pathology and retrocochlear pathology. For cochlear loss, at successive 5 dB increments, tone audibility is longer and longer. Whereas for retrocochlear pathology, the rate is quite rapid, but does not significantly change with intensity increments. So one technique, the, the traditional one, the Carhartt tone decay, the test starts at 0 dB sensation level, means uh, Sensation level means the number of decibels above the threshold. So if it is 40 decibels, it starts at 40 decibels. And along with that, a stopwatch is started. If the tone is heard for the whole one minute, then the test is terminated or done at that particular frequency. And there is no decay. If the patient lowered his or her hand before the end of one minute, then the time heard till the time, say for example, 30 seconds time heard and then lowered. So 30 seconds is recorded and the intensity is raised by five decibels and the stopwatch is reset at zero. So, so this is how it is run and uh, it is repeated. It is carried on on that particular frequency till uh, the whole minute and uh, then 
either till the whole whole uh, one minute or the audiometric limit has been reached say for example if it is it has reached 120 decibels then it has to be terminated or the amount of decay which is significant to be judged has been achieved so all of these uh, steps are repeated for all frequencies and in both ears so this is quite time consuming and uh, that's why uh, further uh, tests were developed, further variations of tests were developed. So one important uh, technique or variation is the Rosenberg's procedure. That is similar to Carhart uh, tone decay procedure, except that the whole test is run for one minute per test frequency. Sustained tone is presented at threshold level and the stopwatch is started. Each time the pers person lowers the hand, the intensity is increased by five decibels until the end of one minute. The amount of decay is then calculated. Uh, uh, if, if it is after one minute, it has to be increased four times in five dB steps, then five multiplied by four is equal to 20 dB is the amount of the, the tone decay at that particular frequency. So all four frequencies in one year and then all four frequencies in the other year. So this saves some time, but still it, it uh, requires, say, for example, uh, four plus four, eight minutes in both the years. Then another variation is the supra threshold adaptation test. So it is again run for 60 seconds. That is uh, one minute at 110 dB SPL. And uh, if the person responds for full 60 seconds, then that it is termed as uh, negative. But if it is lowered before 60 seconds, then it is termed as positive. So at uh, the particular frequencies. So it further uh, uh, reduces time if it is uh, positive. So it is positive because the adaptation has taken place to sustain tones. So this was about uh, the special tests. Moving further, uh, we come to the auditory brainstem response audiometry. So again, the sections would include the audiometry overview, ABR overview, physiology, and the applications and further conclusions. So the auditory brainstem response audiometry is a neurologic test of auditory brainstem function in response to the auditory stimuli. Usually clicks are used as the stimuli and discovered in and reported in 1971 by Jewett and Williston. This, is, this has become the most common application of auditory evoked responses and uh, It refers to an evoked potential generated by a brief click or a tone pip. It is also termed as a tone burst, uh, which is uh, transmitted from the acoustic uh, transducers placed at the ears. It may be insert earphones or headphones. The waveform which is uh, uh, elicited in response to these uh, stimuli are measured or picked up by placing surface electrodes at the skull and or at the ear lobes or the mastoid. The amplitude or the micro voltage of the signal is averaged and is charted against the time in milliseconds. So a waveform uh, is, uh, is uh, observed which shows peaks from 1 to 7, but usually uh, 1 to 5 peaks are the most prominent and most consistent ones, which uh, are clinically useful, but the utility of other peaks has also been reported. So these peaks are usually observed by within the 10 milliseconds of uh, presentation of the stimulus. And usually high intensities are used 70 to 90 dB and uh, 
uh, such uh, robust peaks could be observed at 70 to 90 dB in cases of normal hearing uh, persons. Although ABR provides us with the information regarding the auditory function and hearing sensitivity, it is not a substitute for a formal hearing evaluation. And it results, and the results should always be corroborated in con conjunction with the behavioral observation audiometry. The the behavior uh, behavioral audiometry which uh, in which the pe person's participation is uh, involved. So whenever this is possible, it should always be incorporated. So if we go into the physiology of uh, the generation of these uh, uh, responses, typically click stimuli are used, and uh, the response from the basilar region of uh, cochlea are generated. The signal travels through the auditory pathway from the cochlear nucleus or the complex, which is proximal to the, uh, it, it goes further to the inferior colliculus. The ABR waves 1 and 2 correspond to the true action potentials. Later waves may reflect postsynaptic activity in the major brainstem auditory centers that concomitantly contribute to waveform peaks and troughs. The positive peaks of waveforms reflect combined efferent, also likely efferent, activity from the axonal pathways in the auditory brainstem. The wave one uh, response is the far field representation of the compound auditory nerve action potential in the distal portion of the cranial nerve eighth. The response is believed to originate from the efferent activity of the eighth nerve first order neurons as they leave the cochlea and enter the internal auditory canal. In a study by Lin et al., they, uh, 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 they observed in idiopathic sudden sensorineural hearing losses, the wave one was observed to be significantly prolonged in the cases where incomplete recovery was observed. Uh, as compared to the slight, uh, the, 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 com the complete recovery was involved as compared to the slight recovery cases. In another, if we look further for uh, wave one uh, characteristics, it was observed to be smaller. The amplitude was observed to be smaller in, in, in uh, another study by Bram Hall. And uh, when they compared the the cases of noise uh, exposures in the military veterans. So those who had um, more exposure of noise, so who were exposed to high levels of noises, had smaller ABR amplitudes of wave one. The frequencies which uh, are included in cases where we use tone bursts instead of clicks include uh, 1000 hertz, 3000 hertz, 4000 hertz, and 6000 hertz. And the polarity is alternating. And uh, the wave one amplitudes at supra threshold levels are smaller at all frequencies. And uh, especially those who had high noise level exposures. So the amplitude differences between the groups could not be attributed to either the sex or the outer hair cell function variability. Uh, the investigators, they could not confirm whether the differences were due to the synaptopathic without postmortem temporal bone examinations. Uh, uh, another uh, literature review for ABR wave one amplitude uh, they observed the summating potential to action potential ratio and the speech recognition score in noise with and without temporal distortion. So they uh, suggested that uh, it is there is an, uh, an effective non-behavioral measure of cochlear synaptopathy. Sylvia 
indicated that heart rate variability in, interacts with the ABR, specifically with regard to wave one and particularly in the right ear, suggesting that autonomic control of heart rate is associated with brainstem auditory processing and that vagal tone or cochlear nerve interaction occurs. Uh, the wave 2 is generated by the proximal 8th nerve as it enters the brainstem. The wave 3 arises from the second order neuro neuron activity of the 8th nerve in or near the cochlear nucleus. Literature suggests wave 3 is generated in the caudal portion of the auditory pons. The cochlear nucleus which contains say about 1 lakh neurons, most of which are innervated by 8th nerve fibers. Wave 4th is often uh, associated with the wave 5 and is thought to arise from the pontine third order neuron mostly located in the superior olivary complex, but additional contributions may come from the cochlear nucleus and the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus. Generation of wave 5 is likely to, it reflects uh, the activity of the multiple anatomic auditory structures. It is the uh, component analysis analyzed most often in the clinical applications of the ABR. It is the most robust uh, wave which is observed during the ABR analysis. And uh, it is believed to originate from the vicinity of the inferior colliculus. The second order neuron activity may additionally contribute in some way to wave 5. In uh, 71 preschooler children aged between 3.1 to 4.9 years, it was found that a systematic uh, systematic decrease in wave 5 latency in, uh, was observed, th which indicated the ABR is not fully mature by two years of age, which was thought, thought to be the case earlier. But it, instead, it continues to develop through the childhood uh, preschool years. The sixth and the seventh uh, uh, waves thalamic or medial geniculate body origin is suggested and uh, the actual site of generation uh, of this uh, these waves is still uncertain corresponding uh, pictorial representation of the corresponding sites of generation of these waveforms so we mainly focus on the waveforms on in in, in uh, this particular uh, picture uh, there are two parts. One is on the right side, one is on the left side. First one, if we see the right picture, we can observe wave 1, 3 and 5 at 70 decibels. Then the intensity is reduced to 40 decibels. A reduction in the amplitude of 1, 3, 5 waves can be observed. Further reduction to 20 decibels uh, results in the reduction of the amplitude of the whole waveform. Wave, form, wave 5 is still uh, observable. So, if we, whenever we are doing the threshold estimation, the application, one of the applications of uh, ABR, the threshold estimation, the decreasing intensity uh, is, uh, is applied and the wave 5 is located. If we look at the left, left side picture, here we have used the uh, tone pips or the tone bursts as the stimulus. Uh, in the first case, we had used the clicks as the uh, stimulus. So at in the, in using the tone pips or the tone bursts, 250 hertz, 20 dB, wave 5 observable. At 1000, 20 decibels, wave 5 is observable. 2000, 20 decibels, wave 5 is observable. At 4000 hertz, 20 decibels wave 5 is observable. So these, these are the findings which we observe in a person having normal auditory system. In case there is a um, 
conductive hearing loss wave 135 will be observable but the absolute latency will of all the three uh, waves will be prolonged as compared to the normal whereas the interpeak latency of all the uh, 1 3 3 5 and 1 5 peaks will be the same as the normal so this is uh, these are the characteristics of conductive hearing loss whereas in cases of sensory neural hearing loss the waves uh, the amplitude is reduced as compared to the normal normative data, normative data. and uh, whereas the wave 5 uh, amplitude if we see if we compare to the uh, in cases of neural um, pathologies the retrocochlear pathologies the wave 5 is quite uh, robust in, in in with respect to the amplitude but the latency is delayed in cases of the retrocochlear pathologies so these are the uh, applications if we want to observe the type of hearing loss so other applica the, the applications of uh, abr include the newborn hearing screening programs and the threshold estimation as we have just discussed the site of lesion examination intraoperative abrs going through these applications we observed that uh, when we apply this abr technology to uh, observe the hearing loss in uh, newborns it has been observed that on an average one out of uh, thousand children are born deaf there are different uh, statistics of uh, regarding the prevalence and the incidences of uh, hearing impairments reported by various uh, authors uh, but this happens to be very important uh, observation in in our uh, uh, profession so historically earlier it was uh, only the infants who met with one or more criteria on the high risk register were tested for abrs uh, universal hearing screenings have been recommended because about 50 percent of the infants later identified with hearing losses are not tested when neonatal hearing screening is restricted to high risk groups so recently the hospitals across our country have been implementing universal new newborn hearing screening programs these programs are possible because of the combination of technological advances such as abr and the autocaustic emissions and uh, these equipments if, if whenever they are available have to be used for this uh, accurate and cost effective evaluation of the newborns uh, another variation of uh, abr is the automated auditory brain stem responses uh, in this the screening is done the electrodes have to be placed the transducers have to be placed um, on the scalp and the ears respectively and the intensity is is set at a particular static uh, intensity the level intensity level is one only it is not varied and uh, the number of uh, children going through these procedures uh, they, they they have reported various uh, uh, sensitivities it is 100 percent uh, for this a a auto automated abr and the specificity ranges from 96 to 98 uh, percent when used as a threshold measure to screen for normal hearing each ear may be evaluated independently with a stimulus presented at an intensity level of 35 to 40 db nhl the click evoked abr is highly correlated with hearing sensitivity in the frequency range of 1000 to 4000 hertz the automated abrs test for presence or absence of wave 5 at soft intensity levels uh, and in automated abrs no operator interpretation is required it can be used in the wards or during oxygen therapy without disturbance from ambient noise in uh, 2019 position statement by joint committee on infant hearing uh, they recommended that infants who had passed the newborn hearing screening undergo follow-up testing in the presence of the following risk factors which include early progressive or delayed onset permanent childhood hearing loss 
in infant's family, family infant's family history more than 5 days of neonatal intensive care hyperbilirubinemia with exchange transfusion regardless of the length of stay more than 5 days of aminoglycoside administration asphyxia or hypoxia ischemic encephalopathy extra corporeal membrane oxygenation in utero infection such as herpes rubella syphilis toxoplasmosis or cytomegalovirus uh, the indications further go as uh, whenever the mother is positive for zika infant may show evidence of infection or may not show infection uh, evidence of infection and may show clinical findings or no clinical findings the child has to undergo this abr birth conditions or findings such as microtia atresia ear dysplasia oral facial clefting white forelock microphthalmia congenital uh, microencephaly congenital or acquired hydrocephalus and temporal bone abnormalities the presence of one of over 400 syndromes characterized by atypical hearing thresholds positive cultures for infections linked to sensory oral hearing loss including confirmed bacterial and viral uh, meningitis or encephalitis especially herpes and varicella events that can result in hearing loss including significant head trauma particularly basal skull temporal bone fractures and chemotherapy estimation of hearing at specific frequencies may be observed through the use of brief tone stimulation such as tone bursts concerns by caregivers in terms of hearing speech and language developmental delay and or de uh, developmental regression the abrs may be used to detect auditory neuropathy or neural conduction disorders in the newborns because the abrs are reflective of auditory nerve and brain stem function these infants can have abnormal abr screening results even when the peripheral hearing is normal as observed during the autogastric emission presence the infants that do not pass the uh, newborn hearing screenings do not necessarily have hearing problems when hearing loss is suspected because of an abnormal abr screening result a follow up diagnostic threshold abr test is rescheduled to determine frequency specific hearing status as we can see in this particular uh, picture the wave 5 is observed at decreasing intensity levels whenever abrs are to be applied for detection or identification of retrocochlear pathologies uh, they can be used as effective screening tools in cases such as acoustic neuroma or also known as vestibular schwannoma however an abnormal abr finding may not be suggestive of uh, retrocochlear pathology and it might uh, indicate further uh, investigations the symptoms of eighth nerve pathology uh, include but not limited to asymmetrical or unilateral sensorineural hearing loss asymmetrical high frequency hearing loss unilateral tinnitus unilateral or bilateral poor word discrimination scores as we have discussed earlier as compared with the degree of hearing loss which is sensory neuron type perceived distortion of sounds when peripheral hearing is essentially normal in addition to retrocochlear pathologies many factors may influence abr results which include degree of uh, sn hearing loss asymmetry of the hearing loss test parameters and other patient factors these influences must be factored factored in when performing and analyzing an abr result the findings which are suggestive of retrocochlear pathology in an abr may include any one or more of the following these include the absolute latency of interaural difference wave 5 wave 5 latency of one year and the other year the latencies if we uh, compare them it is prolonged on upon comparison 1 to 5 interpeak interval of 
interaural difference again 1 to 5 right ear 1 to 5 left ear interpeak latencies will be prolonged Ab uh, the absolute latency of wave 5 is prolonged as compared to the normative data absolute latencies and interpeak latencies of 1 3 1 5 and 3 5 are prolonged as compared to the normative data the absent abr in the involved ear in general, ABR exhibits a sensitivity of 90% and a specificity of 70 to 90%. Various uh, uh, various uh, investigators have reported it differently. I'll be skipping some of those slides uh, following. Uh, the sensitivity for it has been observed. Sensitivity for small tumors is not high. Therefore, a symptomatic patient with normal ABR result should receive a follow-up audiogram six monthly to monitor any changes in the uh, hearing sensitivity or the or tinnitus. So, ABR may also be repeated. Uh, various reporters have uh, uh, suggested that uh, for uh, the tumor sizes which are less than one centimeter, sensitivity could be 93%. Uh, some others have reported for 98%, 1.1 to 2 centimeter size, 100% larger than 2 centimeter. Overall sensitivity, 95%. Uh, so I will be going through now. This for, uh, another variation of ABR for small uh, tumor sized uh, uh, detection. This includes <clears throat> the use of <clears throat> stacked derived band ABR that measures the amplitude and very small tumors may be detected more accurately. So this new technique combined with traditional ABRs may soon make possible the detection for very small tumors with accuracy approaching 100% using ABR audiometry. The other applications continue to evolve, but are not limited to the cases having uh, tinnitus. So, one study, uh, so they suggested that uh, in a study that although the overall ABR wave latencies were within normal limits in patients with tinnitus, those patients have longer latencies than control patients without tinnitus. So the tinnitus patients had longer latencies as compared to non-tinnitus patients. So you know, useful monitoring and understanding of tinnitus can be another application. Then the comatose patients, uh, the, the prognostic factors could be uh, in one uh, report, they corroborated that whenever the Glasgow comma scale of three was there and those who also have significantly abnormal ABR had greater probability of dying than those with a normal ABR. Then another, another application has been reported wherein they compared the bipolar disorder type 1, BP1, with those having schizophrenia and uh, they indicated that uh, uh, the wave 3 and wave 5 amplitude was significantly higher in BP1 type case, cases as compared to the schizophrenia. So BPI could be BP1 could be used as a biomarker for uh, uh, the ABR could be used as a biomarker for BPI. So in these cases, uh, the portion of ABR curve containing wave 5 and 7 did not correlate well that uh, as compared to the controls. And uh, they indicated that the BP1 may be associated with thalamocortical circuitry abnormalities. The further going to the uh, another application important one, intraoperative monitoring uh, along with the electrocochleography it might provide early identification of changes in the neurophysiologic 
status of the peripheral and central nervous system. This information is useful in the prevention of neuroautologic dysfunction and preservation of post-operative hearing. For many cases with tumors of eighth nerve or the cerebellopontine angle tumors, the hearing may be diminished or completely lost post-operatively, even when the auditory nerve has been preserved anatomically. So wave one, which is generated by the cochlear end of the eighth nerve provides valuable real-time information regarding blood flow to the cochlea because ischemia is a primary cause of surgery-related hearing loss. Wave 1 is monitored closely for any shift in latency or decrease of amplitude. Wave 1, 2 and 1, 3 interpeak intervals can provide distal and proximal information during eighth nerve surgeries. Wave 5 and 1 to 5 interpeak interval latencies are monitored for shifts or alterations in latency and amplitude. 1 5 latency provides information regarding the integrity of the eighth nerve to the auditory brain stem. The limitations which uh, uh, may be associated with the, these procedures include. Uh, wave 5 alterations occur intraoperatively. They, they do not necessarily reflect the changes in hearing status. Changes in latency may instead be because of uh, the dissynchronization of the neurons or other outside factors. Also, a potential time delay exists between the actual occurrence of the insult and when the shift in the wave 5 appears. So the patients with pre-existing sensory neural hearing loss may have poor waveform morphology and no wave one response. The typical uses of intraoperative auditory brainstem responses include monitoring of the cochlear function directed at the hearing preservation, cerebellopontine angle tumor resection or the acoustic neuroma surgery, vascular decompression of trigeminal neuralgia, Vestibular nerve section for the relief of vertigo, exploration for the facial nerve for facial nerve decompression, endolymphatic sac decompression for Meniere's disease, monitoring brainstem integrity, brainstem tumor resection, brainstem aneurysm clipping, or arteriovenous malformation resection. Uh, in conclusion, we can say that the auditory brainstem response audiometry has a wide range of clinical applications, which include retrocochlear pathology identification, universal neuro, newborn hearing screening, threshold est estimation, and intraoperative monitoring. Additional applications include ICU mon monitoring, frequency specific estimation of auditory sensitivity, and diagnostic information regarding suspected demyelinating disorders such as multiple sclerosis. As the technology continues to evolve, ABR will likely to provide more qualitative as well as quantitative information regarding the function of auditory nerve and brainstem pathways involving hearing. These are my references for ABR. I'm grateful to all the participants for their kind uh, attention and listening. If there are any queries, please. Uh, thanks, Ravi. Thank you for an excellent and a very comprehensive presentation uh, on these difficult topics, uh, which are less commonly discussed, the speech audiometry and the brainstem response audiometry. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, then we can take the questions. I can see there too. Uh, Ravi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> this one question I'll ask, and this is from one of the participants. Is Bera helpful in mild sensory neural hearing loss and for locating cytopathology, especially in press biacusis? So, uh, 
the, the, the question which I understand is, sir, that uh, uh, for mild sensory neural hearing losses, especially in cases of uh, the old age Respect. hearing loss, is, yes, is yes. ABI. Age-related hearing loss. Yes. Age-related hearing sir. loss. Definitely, sir, the... Uh, one of the applications, as we have discussed, is is uh, uh, the type of hearing loss. Second is the degree of hearing loss, which we okay. can definitely apply the ABRs for detecting mild uh, sensory neural hearing losses and uh, associated with the age-related changes. They ha there have been studies, but I uh, uh, have not incorporated in this particular presentation. There have been studies which uh, have demonstrated the uh, waveforms in the Elderly, we can definitely use. So, Ravi, one of the common questions that is asked by the uh, examiners to the postgraduates, since most of the attendees are postgraduate, so which are the tests uh, would you recommend while while the patient is being worked up for a proctor implantation? Uh, for cochlear implantation yes sir uh, sir the, the first and foremost uh, so there are there uh, while while uh, assessing for any candidate for cochlear implantation the the various factors which include are firstly the age of the person if it is a child, then the age related, uh, the age appropriate uh, audiological processes we will be using. And uh, say, for example, if the child is less than less than three years old, then the various behavioral uh, audiological procedures such as pure tone audiograms or speech audiometry may not be possible in such cases. Yeah. So we will be focusing firstly on the uh, the behavioral observation audiometry, which we per, uh, perform whenever uh, the child is less than three years old and uh, wherein calibrated sounds are used to evoke behavioral responses uh, towards the sound, which are the uh, actual um, tests of hearing. Then, uh, firstly, secondly, to to since the middle ear pathology is one of the contraindications for CI, so we will be going for a uh, impedance audiometry. Then, uh, for uh, checking the integrity of the uh, sensory neural pathway, we'll, we will be going for an ABR analysis. So, these are the minimum, uh, this one. And in cases of those who are uh, adults, adults, the children above three years can be conditioned to perform uh, a pure tone audiometry and uh, then apart from this the middle ear tests and the abr so this is to be applied and then further going by uh, advanced aged persons if they 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 can comply well with the behavioral responses we will definitely go for the behavioral ones but surely we have to include the abrs in assessment of uh, cochlear implantation Thank you, Dr. Hitesh. Do you have any comments to make? Hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, good to hear after a long, very long time. So my question okay. is for disability assessment. So when you we will go for beyond PTA, and can BARA also be uh, modified by person? And what we can do in such cases? Thank you so much, sir, for asking this question. This is very much uh, deliberated and required. Uh, what I would like to share my uh, views is that, firstly, disability, whenever we, uh, we address this term disability, the basic uh, concept which I have understood is that firstly there is there has to be some impairment then there has to be some disorder it, it, it has to cause some impairment this disorder has to cause some impairment then it has to be treated to some or the other extent along with some assessments after the treatment has been imparted whatever has been 
left with will be uh, calculated as disability now uh, there have been cases uh, where we observe that uh, usually wherever whenever there are some uh, uh, monetary gains involved some benefits are are involved then uh, the person asking for a percentage of disability may be presenting a false uh, this one feigning feigning the 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 responses so uh, in order to corroborate the behavioral responses the disability calculation has to be done on the basis of the uh, pure tone audiometry which is the gold standard the thresholds of four frequencies 500 1000 2000 4000 hertz have to be uh, put through those formulae to calculate the percentage but if those four frequency thresholds are reliable it is only then we can proceed further so if we corroborate that with uh, other tests such as speech audiometry then uh, our uh, abrs then only we'll be able to come to some useful conclusion majority of the the uh, cases which we see for disability assessment the two uh, results seldom co corroborate usually either uh, the abrs most of the times abrs are have uh, have been observed to be better in cases where the, the monetary gain or benefits are involved so definitely abrs are very much helpful and useful in uh, the the cases where disability has to be given but then the difficulty with the abrs is that if we use the click uh, evoked stimulus then we will be we will not be getting the 500 hertz uh, response it will be mainly focused from 1 to 2000 or more concentrated in the area of 2 to 4000 hertz and uh, if we go for the 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 second alternative is the tone pips if we use the, those as uh, uh, the stimuli then we can get a frequency specific result but then it becomes so time consuming say for example one and a half to two hours at least might go for uh, getting uh, an abr response for the four frequencies in two hertz four frequencies each in the both the years so that means the total eight wave fives have to be, have to be tracked down till the threshold so it, it is so time consuming and then uh, so there are so many more uh, aspects to this but uh, sticking to the specific query that can abrs be used for disability assessment yes definitely they should be in, included in it but have to be used judiciously thank you so there was a second part to this question also can a person affect the abr response dr hitesh has asked that also uh, you meant to ask that uh, if i am being uh, checked Still, for my can abrs be, can yeah. i uh, yeah. raise or lower down my responses is that yeah. the query sir yeah, that was the second question, I think, from Hitesh. Oh, I see. I'm sorry, sir, I missed his, <laughs> his this aspect. But then if I have understood it correctly, what I would like to say is that uh, uh, probably that is not possible. Till now, I have not seen such possibility. Not possible. It's an objective test. I, that's not possible, sir. Not possible. One maximum question, what, I, what I could do is is that if I keep on moving and uh, twitching and uh, <laughs> artifacts will be producing producing and then it will be contaminating the waveform and then it will, we will not be able to conclude anything. It will be just waste, wastage question. of time. That That's all. One question from my side. Dr. Vipin yes. has asked you the test battery for cochlear implant is. Okay. Uh, yeah. You have not mentioned autoacoustic emission and ASSR anywhere in that. No role for that, sir. Actually, I had, I had actually included in my presentation which I I wanted to <laughs> share, mm -hmm. but then since I was given uh, the three topics mainly which I should uh, focus to and and uh, the sticking to the time schedule, I then voluntarily deleted those. Okay, okay, so but definitely uh, auto-acoustic and ASSR. Yeah. Pardon, sir. 
it stands in the way of test battery of ci na very much very much model. helpful autocaustic emissions are very much helpful for assessing the outer hair cell function assrs are again a technological advancement wherein the stimuli are frequency modulated and then the response is from the whole of the auditory system we are able to um, measure the threshold of hearing at four frequencies in both the ears so yes. if we uh, simultaneously present four frequencies in one ear four frequencies in other ear but uh, say for about 45 to 50 minutes maximum one hour we in within this time we will be able to generate the thresholds of hearing for both the ears at four frequencies and then this will definitely helpful be helpful in the calculation of the disability of hearing yes so right sir so thank you dr ravi for uh, sticking to time specially and i was thank wondering you. how will you will be able to complete all these uh, topics in one and a half hour uh, session but you have covered most of the points uh, as far as the residents point of view uh, or their ms dnb exams are concerned so thank you very much sir for uh, taking out your time and sharing your insights and experience with us so uh, now and uh, thank you dr vipin sir and uh, hitesh uh, sir for your uh, participation in today's activity uh, so uh, i would like to invite dr uh, rupender sir for your final words sir unmute yourself still okay. not to please unmute yourself i think it was well conducted zoom meeting and uh, for this i first of all